people ask me, so how do you feel after 11 years? Or mm. quite soon it was 10 years in the company and, and uh, doing what you do, etc. And I say, I really love it mm. to the bone, mm. every day of it. And it's hard, it's not easy. Sometimes it's really frustrating, gets you to the end of nerves. But uh, you're doing something great and I, I see that we are doing something that's really, really good um, for the people, for the environment, at the end for our customers, for the, for the world. We are building products that are influencing the world today in a positive way. And uh, for that I'm really grateful to be in that kind of situation from this small country, from even smaller town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I really find myself very uh, lucky to be in this position. Uh, and I want to, to make sure that I do the most of it from the cars that were dealt to me. So that's, that's easy. Mm. Welcome back to the Recursive Podcast, recording here in Belgrade, where we meet our next guest. He's fascinated by the application of AI, machine learning, data science, and the digital transformation of businesses. Darko Todorovic is VP of Engineering and Delivery at the software company HTEC Group. Prior to that, Darko was in charge of R&D, leading the development center of the company in Niche. Darko is also a PhD candidate in the field of robotics at the University of Niche, where he was head of the robotics laboratory and taught at the Department of Control Systems. Definitely. Darko, welcome to the Recursive Podcast. It's very great that you're here. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, I wanted to go back a bit in time. And mm -hmm. you seem like you've been fascinated about technology for almost your all your life. What what led you there? Like, why did you chose tech for your career? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It was um, it was very uh, let's say like a serendipity or something like that. So it, mm -hmm. it wasn't something that was planned for. When <clears throat> I will fast forward a little bit into into the future, into uh, last year of high school, when I was deciding to go for the faculty, it was between medicine and uh, uh, electronics. Okay. And then I ended up in electronics for I don't know what reasons, maybe practical, maybe a little bit a bit more affinities towards this. But it was always in my head like, shall I go to? study medicine or electronics. Somehow it fascinated, both of those areas fascinated me at, at that point of time. Um, there was also one uh, turning point in my life when I joined for the first time uh, Patents and Science Center. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about this, but this is a, a, a science center in uh, middle of, of the country, near the city of Valjevo, where a lot of talented students go. And uh, I was selected by a group of people to go there and to study some extracurricular, to be in, uh, involved in extracurricular activities. And uh, I ended up in uh, first software engineering and then uh, uh, applied physics uh, and electronics uh, seminars. And uh, uh, I must say that when I look back in what defined my career, it was never a deliberate decision. I always say that I was lucky at some points, but I always say that uh, on the other hand, I had the opportunities that I uh, chose to, uh, to explore. Mm -hmm. So um, there is one thing that you do. I, I stayed for a long time in that uh, science center, later on as educator, then I was uh, leading the seminar that I was a part of uh, during the high school. And when I go back, and uh, um, there is one point in time where you can see your application, and then I saw my application, and I said on the first leg, like, I would never accept me. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you to the guys who, uh, who did accept me at that point of time, because my application was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> what did you write in the application? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was very... You know, uh, there is a trait of my father, and uh, sometimes my wife all, all says that I have a similar trait, that I'm not speaking too much. So I wasn't even <laughs> writing too much at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see. Because you mentioned your father, I wondered, 
when the fields of uh, robotics and, yes. and, and technology where you developed, did you at some point was were lucky enough also to have a mentor? Someone who would guide you through your process, someone who would be a role model maybe as well? Yes, in, in some way. I mean, my father, I can see the resemblance with my father now, mm. but uh, he, uh, he's a physicist, uh, professor of physics, and also he brought me first uh, computer. He was never about teaching me, he was just exposing me to the things. So when I started learning physics in, in elementary school, I asked him, hey, can you help me with this? And he said, here's the book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Read. <laughs> mm. And he's, he was always like that. I was very frustrated with him, but he was exposing me to, to the things. And uh, he didn't do it maybe deliberately, but that was just the way he thought. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I can, going back to the elementary school, I never, I was the first, the only kid in the class that didn't know how to read and write in first grade. Mm -hmm. And he was like, go out, play, explore, do whatever it takes, but when you start school, you're going to learn all the things that you need to learn. There is a program, some smart people thought about that program, and there was some belief and trust in the school system. I think that this is the problem that we are experiencing right now, that we don't have trust in the school system and that we are overburdening the kids with all of these extracurriculum activities. And at that point of time, I had a really good teacher, I had really good um, educators during my elementary school. In the high school, uh, it was kind of easy mm -hmm. because I was in a small town, which is uh, south of Nish. Yeah. And, uh, but I got lucky, uh, as I told you, to go into Petnica Science Center and there to be influenced by really, really good people. Petnica works in a way that uh, uh, people that were there and that had some scientific careers or entrepreneurial business careers, they come back and teach different things. Mm -hmm. And what is more important than that is that uh, I had exposure to uh, different uh, scientific areas, like for example, linguistics, anthropology, uh, uh, geology, something that you wouldn't touch in high school, no way, but you see what people are doing, how they are thinking, what are their methods, and you see the similarities there. And then with that uh, basically exposure and uh, uh, meeting different people, you enrich yourself as a person. So I wouldn't nailed down one particular person as uh, in that early uh, development stage as uh, uh, someone who influenced uh, uh, the most, but uh, circumstances and uh, uh, I guess uh, the exposure to different things in the time when there was no, not such a developed internet connection. I remember one of my first lectures in 2000, this was 2003 or two, something like that, was how to trust the sources on the internet in 2002. Wow. So <clears throat> Already back then. Already back then. I mean, I was a kid in high school who barely used uh, uh, search engines. Well, we didn't have Google at that mm -hmm. point of time. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's, uh, it's an enormous, uh, enormously a big advantage to be uh, in that kind of environment. And somehow everything that, uh, that I was doing after that, even at the faculty, uh, with, uh, with HTEC as a company, is connected to the people that I got to know over there. So mm. this huge network of really, really talented people really made an impact and a difference for me personally. So I would mark that as one, one well, was thing. Was this cross-disciplinary exchange somehow facilitated by a university or did it happen naturally because you were all in the same spot, not remote? <laughs> not remote, you are at the same spot. Uh, you are not instructed to work with each other okay. at all, but uh, you are there for 10 days. It's a village, so mm -hmm. it's a campus, mm -hmm. small campus, and you know everybody over there. So mm -hmm. over the years, I spent around between one, one and a half months each year of there. So you get to know people, uh, the same people, new people come in, go out. Uh, you get to influence other people's lives as well. So it kind of creates uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, the value, uh, what you value as a person uh, 
in inside of other persons and uh, it defines you as a person as well and how you're going to influence the society in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your personal development is very much connected to the world of academia. Yes. So much from what I hear. So how do you see the role of uh, universities today as the breeding ground for innovation? To what extent are businesses now being able also to work together with academia and, yeah. and, and research in order to, I don't know, boost innovation and put more... Yeah, it's devastating that you ask that question. Oh, really? I'm sorry. But I can relate to that. I can relate yeah, to that. Yeah, it's true. But, uh, you know, universities and academia were the breeding grounds of innovation mm. back then. What happened? In I don't between. know. You don't know. <laughs> I can tell you about Serbia. I cannot tell you about other countries. Tell me about it's, Serbia. Uh, but I can mm -hmm. tell you about Serbia is that uh, mm -hmm. basically we lost industry somewhere uh, during the uh, during the nineties. Uh, there was no demand from the industry for the innovation, mm -hmm. so it, academia was left to to work in um, in a vacuum where they didn't know exactly what is needed on the market. Mm -hmm. And then you're, as I say, to do, doing science or doing the research for the sake of science and research. So you don't have the real application. If you're a technical university, if you're an uh, engineering university and you're not uh, um, supporting some basic uh, research, then you should look what is applicable to the uh, industry and what is something that industry will need in two years, five years, ten years from now. So I think this is this is the biggest thing that happened. The second thing that happened is the sheer fact uh, that the most talented people didn't stay at the universities. Most talented people either went abroad to some other universities mm -hmm. uh, to seek uh, uh, the knowledge and the challenges. Uh, and also, uh, in the recent years, they join companies because they have more opportunities, not just financial, but also to work on some very interesting things in the companies or in their own startups, for example, than to do that at the universities. So if you look um, at the university and you look at the average, um, uh, let's say, uh, talent of the people, I don't know how you can measure talent, but uh, you know what I say. Mm. Uh, uh, it, you, if you look at the average talent that is staying at the university is dropping over the years. Mm. So instead of having the best people stay at the university and teach new generations, you have average person and that average is falling down over the period of time because these are not able to teach the new generations, um, uh, let's say, uh, how to, uh, not just the technology, not just the subjects that, that we are teaching to the kids, but also understanding what are the needs of the industry and how to connect those two. So that's why I say it's devastating because uh, if you look 30 years back or 40 years back, all these universities in Serbia, old Yugoslavia at least, were the breeding ground of excellent engineers, of innovations, of uh, a tight collaboration between the industry institutes and, uh, uh, and the universities at the end. So now they are just the place where you get a degree. Do you see a way to reverse this train for, train for brain drain? It will have. Okay. It will have because, the <clears throat> first of all, there is a lot of more opportunities in this region. And, mm -hmm. uh, we can look at the Balkans uh, as a whole. Uh, second thing that is happening is that uh, the pressure from the market or the demand from the market is such uh, immense right now uh, and forget about the layoffs and everything else that is happening there is still a huge need for uh, good engineering talent and I don't think that we are going to be able to fill the gap uh, if we if we all as a society I'm not talking just about this part uh, uh, don't invest a huge amount of uh, funds uh, into into academia. So it mm -hmm. will have to come back for the sake of the future of the businesses that are relying on new technologies and development of new technologies. Do you see also businesses maybe giving a credit to this relationship and starting a bit more to invest and also support academia so that they, you know, get out of this zone? 
Are there companies which are supporting the universities more and more? There are companies okay. that are supporting the univers universities, but uh, I don't think that this is enough. Mm -hmm. So it's the worst thing that you can do is just throw in the money. Mm. Because, and this is the easiest thing. So yeah. you are like uh, washing away your conscience in mm -hmm. a way. So, yes, I supported the lab, I, I give money to the university, etc. But uh, you are not fundamentally changing anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that um, there is a bright future for, for our society, our local society here, if we don't influence the universities fundamentally. And I'm telling you this because I was at the university. I know how it operates. I know that there are fabulous people over there. I know that they are very devoted to their work, but also uh, they are not motivated and uh, there is a lot of internal politics there is a lot of things that you wouldn't imagine you could have because when I joined uh, university to be a teaching assistant it was I was persuaded by uh, one of the greatest influencers I would say in, in my life uh, my mentor mm -hmm. uh, at the university and uh, he he basically persuaded me to start that career path. I didn't plan on it at all. <clears throat> uh, and I was imagining something like that. I didn't, I didn't see myself at that point of time that I was good enough to actually be at the university. That's why I didn't plan at all to, to start doing that. And somehow I started uh, working at the uh, robotics lab uh, in the third uh, year of the faculty, did some projects, uh, it was very interesting for me, and then we continued the collaboration. And uh, um, I thought that uh, this is an elitistic institution at that mm -hmm. point of time, but uh, you know you realize it's not like that and then you you basically you do whatever you can to move the needle but uh, you as an individual is not just enough mm -hmm. and then you just go with the flow mm -hmm. and then i realized at one point of time okay i don't want to go with the flow i'm going to do something that i'm good at uh, with htech and maybe someday i'm going to be able to significantly influence this university uh, in the best possible way I can imagine that um, coming out of academia and then moving to business, especially in the environment of HTEC, where we saw this company growing very yeah. fast, and I guess it's a very dynamic environment, that there might be a culture clash. How did you walk through that culture clash? You know, okay, I have this experience, it's in academia, and then mm -hmm. I'm moving to business, and then the world is probably a bit different. Were well, you prepared for that? Okay. I never thought about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, I have the same principles. So mm -hmm. You do the best that you can to the best of your abilities. Mm -hmm. So this is the one thing that uh, is always driving me. So do the right thing at okay. the end of the day. So if, if you look at the students and then uh, you have some uh, students that have some uh, personal problems or something like that, you try to understand, you try to get to know them. It's the same with the people because HTEC is growing on the great people and the great culture that we created as a group mm -hmm. from the beginning. And uh, this, this culture is very, very simple. Do the right thing for the person. If uh, we, when we were a smaller company, we had instances for people that, that were really, really good, that we wanted to keep, but we realized we cannot offer them what they need. And mm -hmm. we cannot offer them the experiences they seek at that point of, uh, of time in life. Mm -hmm. And then we offered to find them even the work somewhere abroad or something to help them out. So it's the most important thing for me when creating, working at the university and creating the, um, in a way, influencing the, the, the creation of the culture in, in HTEC was uh, to create an environment where people can become the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that has driven me personally uh, throughout these years. And we had our ups and downs and struggles. But uh, when I see people that uh, we have given a chance uh, to, uh, to basically um, move us uh, in the right direction and move their uh, personal uh, careers uh, in, in very positive way, this is a great achievement for me. So I think that uh, at the end of the day, you need to be very proud of what you're doing in order for you 
for you to be motivated. And still, after 11 years with HTEC, I'm very, very much motivated for what comes next. I was just about to ask you, how big was the company when you uh, started 11 years ago? It was less than 10 people. Less than 10 people. Yes. And currently you're more than 2,200, right? 2,300. 2,300 people. I don't know the, how, the exact uh, number. <laughs> okay. You're not you know, responsible for HR, but still, I mean, I think shaping the culture of the company pretty much starts exactly with those 10 people <laughs> who yes. were there in the beginning yes. because they would... It's a crazy kind of, bunch. It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is a crazy bunch. But how do you manage to keep this red line when you're scaling that fast? Uh, hard. Mm. You know, the, you see something happens uh, that you would never do, mm -hmm. you know, because you've grown. There are some people that have joined recently and they are doing the the things in a way that they are used to. So mm -hmm. basically they're coming from different cultures, different companies. And then something happens, then you react. It's about how you react on the things that you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, you change policies, you change things, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you make sure that you do the best that you can about the people that you have. And you take responsibility for the people that you have hired, that you are going to promote, etc. And over the, we had more time, I would say, to influence each individual person. Now we need to scale that to the point where you can influence more people in the organization to accept that kind of a culture. And we don't want to turn that into the bureaucracy, basically. This is something yeah. that we want to avoid uh, at all means possible. And this is how we are actually building the structures in our organizations so that you have um, a smaller group uh, of uh, uh, or part of the business or call it a business unit where you have up to 150, 200 people so that you still have that global culture and then micro culture inside of that group of people because People stay within the companies um, if the, the the salary is good, if they are challenging projects, but also they stay because of other people, because how they feel working day in and day out, uh, because they feel that they have support, uh, because that uh, no matter what happens, somebody is going to keep their back. And this is really, really important that you feel safe in the environment, because when you feel safe, then you can tell anything that you think okay. and you receive the right feedback. You provide the right feedback and then the management of, of the company can actually receive the right feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is swept under the rug and we are trying to emphasize on that kind of a culture. And uh, over the time, people just uh, see that as probably some um, value that you cannot define. But it feels like good being that in that kind of environment. I think this that is the special thing about culture. I mean, yes. there, you know, there's so many companies who would say, "Yeah, we have a great culture," but what, it's so intangible. It's something like a magic. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I sometimes I, I can't even say how, how what is the culture in in my in our own company. We're like I don't know twelve. 13 people right now. Yeah, oh, great, amazing. <laughs> yeah, th there is this certain magic that you can never really define, that you can never really touch, but it is there. Yeah, and yeah. it's changing over the time. Mm. Uh, it's changing because uh, you, you, all of us are changing. I mean, me, five years ago or two years ago, I didn't know nothing. <laughs> I see that all the time. And then you have to be open-minded to everything that is new, everything that you receive as a feedback. What did and you learn in the past four to five years? Because you said you didn't know anything. I didn't Which know was... anything about business. Yeah. Yes. What did you learn? Well, I start, I'm start. i starting to learn about business itself, <laughs> how it operates, how it works. Mm. I'm just starting. Because yeah. up until now, it was... <sighs> I, I always call it opportunistic. Uh, you okay. have the opportunity to grab it yeah. every time, work on it, work on it. But then you need to become systematic and we need, uh, from, from my side, to invest more time into understanding the dynamics of the business mm -hmm. in order to uh, pull the right levers in order to make success for the business itself in the long run. Okay. 
Mm. So whatever we are doing, we are looking at the long run all the time. We are not looking at the short-term gains, profits, etc. This is, is the, the mentality. What is long-term in your vision, in your planning at HTEC? Is it like five years, ten years? How how much in the future are you trying to optimize for? Well, we try to to look short term to see basically how mm. the business is operating but when we are making decisions it's it's on the long term it's like if we never make any decision that is uh, bounded by a time frame or a number mm -hmm. so because you want to constantly improve the business itself yeah. you don't want to bind yourself with the number and say hey i want to reach here and this is if you want to reach here then you're setting up yourself to that point mm -hmm. but if you say okay i don't care where i'm not going to reach i just want to improve over the time then you don't have boundaries and what is a big vision then if you have to put it in one sentence Big vision. Yeah, of HTEC. To be the best service providing company in engineering and really to fix mm -hmm. that notion of companies relying on service providers just for um, the sake of efficiency, just for the sake of uh, being able to scale fast, and then we are going to build our own teams, etc., etc. Why people do that? Uh, why people rely on that? Mostly because they have been burned, especially big companies and corporations. Mm -hmm. If you take different big, uh, uh, well-established companies, they come in, the presentation is flashy, but uh, the execution afterwards is not so good. We want to be the company that is going to give you end-to-end -end everything. And I think that we have relied too much or, or basically focused too much, maybe too much, on providing the really, really good service and product for uh, the companies that we work with, mm -hmm. for our partners, then on, uh, I don't know, marketing, uh, selling of our services, et cetera, et cetera. We are changing that right now because we are growing as an organization. But at, at the end of the day, put yourself in the shoes of the buyer or, or the partner that is uh, <coughs> writing a couple of million dollar checks to work with a company that, and the people that they never met with. Mm. ocean away mm. so it's a huge amount of trust that somebody needs to put in you it is. and then you have to be responsible and i see companies that are not responsible the founders the people they're just not thinking in those terms it's like okay they need something coded that we are going to code it pay for that and that's it so mm. when you look at it in that simple terms then you cannot build really a great company and i think that talent that we have here uh, the education that is rooted in math and still is okay and much better than I would say uh, uh, out there uh, is giving us enough substance and material to build really, really good engineering products. Mm -hmm. Where we are not good is business. And this is what we need to learn. How it operates, what are the levers, how we can make sure that we can create sustainable company for the longer run. And these are the things that we need to to learn, basically. Mm -hmm. And we are constantly learning. And as I progress uh, through throughout the career, I, I had that luxury of being uh, at academia at the same time. So my brain was in a research mode, uh, understanding different areas, understanding what the future brings, uh, speaking to the different universities uh, abroad and, and people from those universities, creating friendships that really give you a bit of information here, be there, be there, and then when you combine that with what we are doing at, uh, uh, at HTEC, you really can see how you can shape uh, the, the products that the businesses are going to use uh, tomorrow. Yeah, I think academia is definitely teaching you how to think. <laughs> at <laughs> least it's, one it's, thing it's is, a, yes. It's at least doing that, yeah. yeah. Or many, th many other things, but I think this is the central. I was thinking when you were speaking about the opportunistic or maybe rather short-term goals of uh, software companies, that it's not only about that, it is also about the brand that we have created here in Southeast Europe. I think because the or technical systems, say, no. yeah, they grew 
pretty much from the outsourcing industry yes. where we, you know, jumped in as implement, um, the, you know, the people who are just going to implement and we're going to just execute certain things um, that we were hired because of the efficiency. I mean, we were cheaper, you know, the taxation, at least in Bulgaria, was very <laughs> beneficial and we would attract exactly all those kind of um, corporations who are going to just, you know, give us that job. And over the years, there was a lot of knowledge that was accumul accumulated. And now we are, I think, more and more able to um, do strategy, to build products, to do actually sure. real innovation. But how do we change this brand? How do we change this image? And well, I see, obviously, HSEC now, you know, leading this, uh, this trend or leading this um, Well, this is one, one of the goals that we have. Okay. is to put this region on a map where you have really talented people that can create anything. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are not going to be the best one in quantum computing, but I know people that are from this very city, basically, that are leading the way in quantum computing. So I think that... Um, I think that this... One of the missions that we have in HTEC is, as I told you, to put the region on the map. What mm -hmm. that means? That means that we are not an affordable uh, option. Mm. We are not an option where you go to cut the prices. Mm. We are an option where you go to solve your biggest and toughest problems that you have. If you want mm. something executed fast, if you want something executed with a quality, then you come to this region because you have really good companies that understand how to do that and to help you out on your journey. And um, really, I think that uh, HTEC is doing the part of it. Uh, all of other big companies that have development centers here as well, uh, but also uh, the uh, new scene that is emerging with startups that are being um, very much recognized on the world map are helping as well. Yeah, true. So everybody is is doing their part, but I do think that um, that Asia now with a really huge footprint has uh, a lot of and can have a, a lot more influence. Will have a lot more influence in the future for sure. And there is also something else that I can definitely relate to. I think before that we would look at uh, you know Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania like separate countries, but in fact we can leverage the resources that we have on a regional level Absolutely. because we're so close to each other. We spoke just before the podcast how close to each other we are culturally yeah. <laughs> and in terms of mindset that we would definitely benefit when we uh, reshape this brand on a regional level and not on a national level like we used to do before, yeah. like in yeah. this small competition. Uh, this is how we would probably manage to grow the pie bigger. And we would never have the numbers, you know, in terms of outsourcing. There will be probably from now on many regions which are going to be cheaper, which are going to be faster in supplying with coders. Although now with AI, I'm not even sure that we would need that many coders in the future, but that's we'll a different more. story. We'll need more. <laughs> we'll need more. <laughs> okay, this is another thing that I'm going to ask you about just in, in, a, in a second. But yeah, I think it is uh, one thing that we have in common with HDAC, the recursive, that we are striving to put the region on the map in terms of that. Um, now, talent. So if the universities are in that bad shape in Serbia, and I can say about the same thing in Bulgaria, with one exception now, it's, a, it's like a startup research center that we have called Insight, which is mm -hmm. trying to do things in a totally different way. But uh, many people from the tech ecosystem are disappointed by the academia that we have there. Uh, probably it's pretty much similar in other countries in the region. How are we going to grow this talent? How are we going to continue this tradition of smart people that you would need at HTEC in order to change this perception and, you know, build this best company? How are we going to grow them? What is your plan <laughs> at HTEC? <laughs> because I think this is the big competition that we're currently yeah. in on a global scale. Who is going to attract the smartest people in the world? 
Very broad and, and hard question. It is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think this, yeah. we can speak about this for days. <laughs> yes, true. But uh, fundamentally, one of the things that HTEC uh, decided when it comes to this uh, CSR activities is to focus on uh, education. Mm. Um, and this is going to be for us a focus uh, definitely in the future to create partnerships with the universities that make sense. But I think that uh, uh, companies can do to the certain extent something. Mm. But if you don't have a feed in of really good material for the universities, then it's very hard to make something very good. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think that we need to go back down to the high school system, mm -hmm. elementary school system. And this is where the, the states can do something because most of the schools in Serbia, I believe in Bulgaria, is the same thing is the state yeah. schools. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, this primary education is really, really important. And there is really one really good initiative in, in Serbia that started a couple of years back. It's called uh, uh, Petlja. Mm -hmm. uh, which means loop. Okay. Uh, uh, and they are, um, they created a lot of exercises in curriculum uh, and helped establish uh, programming courses uh, very early into elementary school. Mm -hmm. So this is now part of the program uh, in whole Serbia and it rolled out on the whole country, I think two or three years back, something like that. I'm not 100% sure. And I believe that uh, exposing young people to this is going to help us have more quality people and more interested people coming into the universities. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I wanted also to mention during my tenure at, uh, at the university, when I was studying, we had, I don't know, probably less than 10% of women in, in our uh, classes. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's closing to 30, 40% which is which is really this is really, great wow okay. this is really really good wow. uh, this is my personal perception i don't know the the overall <laughs> statistics but the, what i saw at the university mm -hmm. and what i saw also is that uh, women are more diligent more uh, goal oriented and uh, uh, basically you can see that uh, probably when you look at the 100 best students that you have, probably 50% are women, if not even more. Hmm. Okay. Which is a really, uh, really positive thing mm. for me, because mm. you have differences uh, of opinions, you have different uh, way of looking at the world, you have, you, you acknowledge that as a part of the culture, as a part of the uh, ecosystem where you work in, uh, and I think this is this is really good. I jumped from one topic to the other, but I just wanted to say that uh, that kind of diversity that is happening is really a good thing, mm -hmm. uh, which means that uh, um, uh, in general society sees that there is a good opportunity for people if they are studying uh, electronics, computer science, uh, etc. Yeah. So, um, but I think that uh, if we want to do something. Uh, uh, substantial uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, need for good talent is not going to stop it's going to just expand when yes. it comes to the engineering uh, and uh, uh, in order to solve it is it's not going to be solved very quickly you cannot just uh, uh, pick people from the street and then have courses and uh, teach them how to to code or create good engineering products uh, this is something uh, as a generational problem that we as a society needs need to to solve. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why I'm, <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen fast. But if we don't do anything, it's going to start happening later. Mm -hmm. I think there is uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know discussion around AI and uh, what are going to be the skills of the future that, uh, mm. you know, especially engineers would, would need to, to have in order to be successful. Now with the, the chat GPT trend uh, and is in the general, general um, generative AI, the discussion has been warmed up. It's not that, you know, there is so much more new that we can say about it. Mm. 
or become it, it arrived to the end user, you know, to <laughs> people who weren't in touch with AI before. And still, we were speaking about um, coding. Now we would rather teach machines how to code. So if you're looking at the best talent that you want to, let's say, acquire at HTEC, what are the skills that you would be looking at? How to solve problems. How, how do you see that in a person? How do you see that in a person? Mm. Do you need to be good at math, let's say? <sighs> Problem solving? No, <laughs> mm. you need to hustle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You need to, yeah. I, I think that problem solving is really broad term. It is. And uh, there are some people that are really good in finding loopholes. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, you have different characters. They will always try to find a loophole in the shortest path possible, but not create the really good products. You you have people that uh, have been able to do that, and then over the period of time, create the knowledge uh, and strategies of how to create really future-proof products. Mm -hmm. So you can see that different people developed in different ways. Uh, some just stay lazy over the period of time and some of the people are just not that good problem sol solvers. And I think that most of these people uh, basically are going to become a commodity when AI uh, Excel. okay. yes, excels. So AI is not going to be able to help us solve problems, to find itself in a completely new set situation. As you said, it's a generative, which means that based on the experiences that people feed in, it can generate the outputs, but you cannot expect it to be uh, smart in a way that that people are smart in any time soon. In my opinion, it can mimic smart, but not to be as smart. Well, it brings me to a bit more philosophical question, but I would still ask it to you. Um, as in some ways, I think now that we are trying to replicate the models of human thinking, let's say, onto mm -hmm. machines, um, it pretty much confronts us also with the question of what is intrinsically human, like what is smart? I mean, we call all these technologies smart technologies, we yeah. call them intelligent. So we use terms that we are usually going to use for people, and at the same time there are limitations. And I think problem solving might be one of the things that we cannot really teach to machines, but I don't know. I'm going to go with your perspective here. What is what is going to be really smart? What like what is human smart? You said, you know, that AI will never be able to do that. Well, what? I cannot say never. We can still probably call at smart one point of time, yes. Yeah, but okay. I do believe that there is a sequence of events that need to happen, and this is to first understand us to first understand how our brain works, mm -hmm. and then maybe we can mimic that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, uh, I don't know what is happening in the research, research organizations, the labs right now, everywhere in the big companies uh, mm -hmm. and uh, research institutions, but I know that our knowledge of uh, how the human brain works only accelerated in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we we are there are many theories right now how certain things work inside of the brain. Some of them have been uh, proven by the experiments, but actually we don't know as a definite answer. This is how our brain works, mm -hmm. and I don't think that we are going to be able to mimic our behavior or create a machine that is going to be similar to us. And I don't think that uh, anybody actually aspires to that. So we want to have machines work on the things that we don't want to work on, where they can excel and where they can help us in in day to day work. Going back to coding, so you be have, rather complementary, not yes, interchangeable. Okay. Yes. Uh, going back to coding, if if you have. Um, repetitive tasks and you have them a lot so you're creating a web page you need to create uh, interface buttons you need to adjust it to different browsers etc etc it's much better that you feed in uh, a lot of examples into uh, LLM 
and then mm -hmm. you get out a, a product that is going to help you out with that if you just give simple instructions of what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So this is a great advantage. This is something that is going to be used because you're not going to focus 80% of your time coding the things that you've done, I don't know, 10 times by now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are actually going to devote your time into optimization, creating algorithms, uh, adding value to the product, understanding the customer base, understanding how the product could be better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, it's going to just shift to something that is more value add than repetitive task of moving the pixels left and right. <laughs> Definitely. And how do you create a company with such kind of culture? where you are at the frontier of you know the technologies where you think ahead and in a way are close to the research are close to what the market is going to ask of you how do you do that in in h tech well you find very good people okay and uh, you try to to provide them with uh, really good challenges along mm. the way mm -hmm. And then you also, you know, it's it's about mixing and matching, finding the right person, then the project comes in and say, hey, this person would be great for this. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking like that in those terms, then uh, you are allowing for that to happen. And going back to the uh, to the culture and the, and the safety net that I was speaking about, mm -hmm. you need to give space to people to breathe. So the, okay. in order for the innovation to happen, they need to try things and fail. And when they fail, you need to support them and say, hey, okay, let's not do that again. Let's move to something else. And this is one of the core things that we have been doing from the get go. You try something, you fail. I always say I'm probably the one that had most of the failures inside of the company, not the one <laughs> but and for 11 years they haven't fired you once no <laughs> <laughs> nice okay because you need to try things you need okay. to to explore you need uh and you need in order to do that to set that kind of a culture you need to do it yourself you cannot be risk averse if you want to accomplish great things you cannot be completely risk averse if you're risk averse then you're going to do the things that are going to kill the innovation that are going to kill that spark. Mm -hmm. And that spark is really, really important to build something that is great. <laughs> I wonder how hard it is in an environment where you actually have a principle where you work for a customer because basically they will they could always say, well, we hired you to do that. Why are you failing? Like, why are you experimenting? You should know how to do that. You invest. You invest. Okay. Well, we invest as a company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes we invest and we say to customers, okay, we are going to do this. You don't want to do this? Mm -hmm. Okay, we are going to do this because we think that this is going to really be a game changer for you. Okay. And then you do a POC, then you do a presentation and they say, hey, we don't have a budget for this. Okay, we are going to invest. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be our IP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> At the end, it's not, it's not our IP. Uh, it's our approach mm. to the things. It's our approach to the partnership. And this is... This is the part where you really put yourself in the shoes of that company and that person over there. But it's also showing an entrepreneurial culture where uh, you, despite your growth, you actually stay true to that. I mean, yes. you started with a certain risk and then you continue taking certain risks because it is part of who you are, obviously. I don't know. When you look at retrospect, you see that these are risks mm. and risky moves. But at the point of time, it was just the thing that should have been done. Mm. It's quite obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite easy. So I don't think that we deliberately created the culture. I think that we are now putting the culture on the paper because we have been living it through mm. I don't know, 10 or more years to make sure that it's distributed in the right way throughout the company. Mm. Because we have to finish our conversation, you have a busy schedule, although I would rather keep you even longer here with me. Uh, I can spare 15 minutes, for that, <laughs> but not more than that. I wanted to, <laughs> yes, I wanted to ask you about a bit the future, like what is coming ahead. And I truly believe that um, when we are headed to somewhere, let's say we have a vision and we want to get there, mm -hmm. that it's a nice exercise to visualize. This is why you call it a vision. 
Yeah. So when we speak about the moment where the region becomes a place of choice for mm -hmm. corporations, and maybe not only, you know, let's say organizations with big challenges, sure. that they're going to come for to this region in order for these challenges to be solved, that we're not going to be hired for the cheap labor or, I don't know, whatever, you know, other Let, reasons. Let's call it affordable. <laughs> cheap <laughs> means it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> affordable or whatever. Uh, how would you know that we got there, that we are now the place where big challenges are solved and you know, corporations and organizations come to this region in order for those big challenges to be solved. How would you feel that? How would you know that? Do you have like a, like a marker? Yeah. Yeah. Probably it's going to happen like this. That thing happens. Yeah. And then five years later, you're looking at the retrospect and oh, this happened. That was the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, later. Okay. Okay. Because let's say. it's it's. I only I only see the holes. I only see the things that we need to improve on, to work on. Yeah. I don't see what's good. I oh, really you have good. the same curse like me, like you're an optimizer. Yeah. <laughs> you see things that need to be solved or things that are broken and then you're like compelled to work on them and then only in retrospect you think, ah, oh, that was actually a good moment. Why, yes. why didn't I enjoy it more? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Well, yeah. that, that gives you some motivation, gives you something to work on. And I, I tell to everyone, people ask me, so how do you feel after 11 years? Or mm. Quite soon it was 10 years in the company and, and uh, doing what you do, etc. And I say, I really love it mm. to the bone, mm. every day of it. And it's hard. It's not easy. Sometimes it's really frustrating, gets you to the end of nerves. But uh, you're doing something great, and I, I see that we are doing something that's really, really good um, for the people, for the environment, at the end for our customers, for the, for the world. We are building products that are influencing the world today in a positive way. And uh, for that, I'm really grateful to be in that kind of situation from this small country, from even smaller town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I really find myself very uh, lucky to be in this position uh, and I want to to make sure that I do the most of it from the cars that were dealt to me so that's that's easy mm. yeah I can agree here um, talent comes often with responsibility yeah first of all to realize it you know to bring it to the world to manifest it in in a solution or you know solving a problem when you have this talent and then the second one is to do it in a way that is going to be beneficial for society for the businesses for yeah. for the world in general this is one of the latest realizations that i had you know <laughs> it's not yeah. enough just to have talent <laughs> exactly at <laughs> the end of the day you are sharing uh your day-to-day -day life uh with all of the people you're mm -hmm. sharing with the people that work at the supermarket where you buy or the um, I don't know, where you buy vegetables or something like that. So these are all people that you share your life with. And uh, you, we cannot stay in our small bubble and say, okay, this is just a small bubble where we are. But you cannot, you can focus your energy uh, and you can focus your time and devote your time to building something that is going to provide a greater good consequently for the I don't know, other people, generations to come, etc. Mm -hmm. You can see that with the number of salaries in Serbia and surrounding countries that uh, HTC is giving to the people, that money is staying in this country, coming outside, mm -hmm. being put in here, and then other um, uh, parts of, uh, of industry are going to be pushed forward just a little bit. And, and this is also an important aspect. Uh, you don't have to do it uh, directly. You can do it also indirectly by building a really successful company in this region. No, creating value is one of the um, one of the upsides of doing innovation because we yes. are creating value uh, in, in business ways, but also in a, in in terms of the uh, for the whole society. But I'm thinking there is something else which is special for the tech ecosystem and it's exactly this mindset of the problem solvers and sometimes i wonder is there a way where we can transfer this mindset also to wider 
um, groups of the society where we, I don't know, get them of this victimized role sometimes where they just say that everything is bad and the state is never going to be better yes. and you know it's the corruption will stay and they actually see the little aspects where they can contribute where they can actually solve certain problems i think we have this in the tech ecosystem and i would yes but we are just building this in a tech ecosystem yeah and uh you know there is there are mechanical engineers mm, true it's not just software engineering. True. And we are yeah. often referring only to software engineering. I'm not even an engineer, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, there are uh, chemists, physicists. There mm -hmm. are people in other industries that we are completely neglecting. Like yeah. they don't exist. <laughs> yeah. We have yeah. one uh, wonderful client where we need to have uh, people that have coding skills but uh, a physics background and mm. most of the people that we have in that team are PhDs have PhDs in physics mm -hmm. and they work part-time part-time in Institute Academia part-time on, on this project because these are for example type of things that you can influence other areas as well and we are seeking those kind of collaborations and trying mm. to find people that understand this business side but uh, and also to provide them with the really, really uh, good challenges that are applicable today. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is a small thing that we are doing for, for the society right now and for other areas as well. And you can go as far as, as, as um, your ability to recognize the opportunities for those other people are. Mm -hmm. So you cannot say, okay, we are a software company, but we are going to do physics and chemistry and uh, um, I don't know, um, mechanical engineering, etc. But if you can have projects where you have most multidisciplinary tasks, then you can bring in some people to, to help out and try out. And I yeah. think this is important. This is a small thing that you can do. As a society, to become innovators, I, th I think that th there should be a goal to, to do that. But... Uh, it's so far away from where we are right now that, you know, it's, it's the same everywhere in the world. You cannot expect 90 or 100% of the population that is going to be innovative. You can expect from 1%. Mm -hmm. But if you create an environment where that 1% can really succeed and not bother with everything else, then you have a really good combination. But I, I think that everybody takes part. We just need to push forward and... Uh, if you try to make some grander plan about it, uh, you're just going to drown. Mm. Hmm. Okay, interesting. But at least that in Serbia you have the right uh, role model, Nikola Tesla, right? Yes. <laughs> he has been inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Someone who is now currently, you know, ce um, celebrated everywhere in the world. Yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lon. Uh, Dark yeah. it was <laughs> it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for um, sharing your perspective. I, you know, I, I also enjoy people who are coming from the different walks of life and uh, who have been around. And talking to someone who spent a lot of time in academia it gives a different perspective to business. Yeah. I think this is. Uh, Although you still have to learn business, as you say, or I think this is you the unique thing that is actually bringing you yeah. a certain edge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. And I wish you a lot of success at HTech. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you have a great mission. Next on the Recursive Podcast, CEO Entrepreneur and CEO of the marketing tech company Hunch, Sini Sarakovic. Fortunately, unfortunately, we have um, a pretty low cost of living in this part of the world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean all things uh, considered, which means that, and we also have something else, which is like, it's totally normal for, you know, people to live with their parents until they're 30, right? <laughs> True. So, if you, so let's take those two examples, right? <laughs> right? Um, very little risk, right? So sure. think about it, like a typical person that might be um, a stellar engineer or somebody that's thinking about, you know, that's a creative person, that, that's a creator, that's a builder, right? Yeah. Um, you know, he gets, you know, offered maybe, um, to go work at a big company, right? It's the dream that they've been, you know, whether it's Microsoft or you know, exactly. others, whatever. Have it's, this big name in the city. Yeah, let's, whatever, whatever <laughs> you replace with whatever industry that, you know, that that's true, um, that they've made it, right? So in that, in that, 
storyline, you know, that we've been told, you know, go to school, have good grades, you know, get a job. That today um, is happening, right? And people are, you know, living at home with parents and they're thinking, okay, I need to go get that job in order to have that, you know, financial freedom. And, but then they still live with the parents and then after a few years it's over. So to me, you know, when I think of, um, you know, people that are at Stanford, um, that is a diametrically opposite point of view. Most okay. people that are thinking about starting companies are in, starting ideating or starting companies at 20, 21, 22. The reason is because you have nothing to lose except your time. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.